Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back to the podcast. Today's special guest is Mr. Dan Drew, an Irish dancer and Irish dance show performer. And I wanted to have Dan on to talk a little bit about his history and his recent uh, tour with the Celtic Angels show. Dan, good to have you on. Good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Start us off in the beginning. How did you get involved with Irish dancing? Ah, well, like many a a young man, um, my sisters were doing it. Mm. And uh, my mom didn't particularly want to drive to multiple after school activities. So um, my sister was was quicker at getting her homework done. So she got to choose what the activity was. <laughs> uh, and I think after about one lesson of me sitting out in the waiting room and bouncing off the walls, my mother said, get, get in there. <laughs> like, bother, bother that poor woman. Um, so, uh, I did. And, um, we started competing and for me, as soon as there was like, uh, Oh, I can win a medal for doing this. Like it, it, it shifted in my brain. I was really competitive about it. And, um, a lot of my family did it. I have probably 15, like close relatives that grew up, grew up around me. So it just sort of became a thing to do. Um, in my professional life, I'm a, I'm a theater performer. Um, I'm an actor and I do scenic and lighting design as well. For me, dance shows kind of tour two major times of the year. Uh, you know, Christmas and St. Patrick's Day are big seasons for, for Irish shows. Um, I mean, Riverdance and Lord can tour whenever, but for the rest of us, those right. are kind of big seasons. Um, <laughs> since my professional life has been very much like, you know, gig oriented, uh, it was feasible for me to just incorporate these shows into my, my normal calendar, which has been really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So who are, who are your dance teachers and, and where are you located or where did you take Irish dancing? I am from Newark, New Jersey. Uh, I still live in the area and I started dancing for the Peter Smith School of Irish Dancing. Uh, okay. For those of you who may be in Kogel or WIDA and aren't familiar with commission schools, uh, mm-hmm. Peter Smith, my teacher, was one of the founders of the Irish Dancing Teachers Association of North America. He ran a school for, I think, 55 years. Uh, and when he finally passed away a few years ago, um, we rebranded as the Heritage Irish Dance Company, and uh, that's currently run by Amy Siegel, Terry Zimmer, and Jimmy Friel. So those were my teachers, yeah. you know, and uh, dear to Gary and a couple other people. It was a big family. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, most of us, well, at least those who, who watch this podcast in America that probably would not have come up, Kogal, we, most of us have a commission background and everybody knows of Peter Smith School. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, legendary teacher for sure. Uh, if you will, Dan, just for a couple of minutes, touch on some of the memories you have of, of dancing with that school, maybe some of Peter and maybe some, you know, without Peter. Let's see. So my first dance class uh, was with <laughs> um was was with the peter smith school but a woman named noreen hughes who used to teach for skull rank assertia up in new york um and is also an actor uh she was at the time the person i thought was the adult it was apparently about 14 15 years old running okay this class. um i have a lot of really great memories of running around that ywca and uh just causing a lot of havoc Looking back now, I can definitely kind of, you know, I, I can definitely appreciate times when I'm fairly certain that Peter was just at his wits and <laughs> go over there and work with, drill the steps with her. Um, I started competing more heavily as I became a teenager. And um, yeah, I remember a lot of like the Rockland County Fesh was a big Fesh for us up in uh, at, up in Rockland County, New York, and it's in the middle of summer. And for the longest time, I guess for five or ten years, something like that, it was so hot that there was a standing thing that the whole competition was in shorts and t-shirts. So, because <laughs> you know you're out in the middle of a field and you have these parents going, "I am not velvet dresses." you know, right. are, are still sort of a thing in the very heavy material. 
the parents are like, I'm not putting this $2,000 dress on my child to have heat stroke to go right. out and dance on the stage there. Um, so I remember that really vividly. Um, we had some, when Peter, Peter kind of transitioned into, uh, first he brought Jimmy Friel back to teach with him. And then, you know, he, he was getting older and transitioning more of the day-to-day -day teaching away. Um, and when he was wheelchair confined, like a lot of us who were in our, I guess I was in my late teens at the time, it was kind of like, you knew something sort of serious was happening. You're old enough to rationalize that. Um, and there was a group of eight of us that were in college at the time and had kind of taken a step back from team dancing. And it was, um, I forget whose idea it was, but we're, we're just going to come back and do, do one more eight hand for Peter, you know, just, just yeah. one just so that he can have a, he can have a senior mix team in the group. Right. And we wound up, uh, we wound up winning. And there's a um, great picture of the eight of us running over to the front of the stage and he's sat there in the wheelchair and we're pouring over the front of the stage, trying to hand him the cup and the trophy. And he's going, I didn't win this kind of thing. Like, you know, right. um, you know, I, I really, I remember that very strongly. Um, he was a really cool guy um, and a really wonderful person. And one of the, uh, one of the, the benefits, I don't know if that's the right word for having dance for him is that there are a lot of, a lot of the schools around where I live were either started by one of those initial founding members or were directly his students. Right. So a lot of the schools around here were, um, are, are run by, by former students. And so, you know, every time we get together, there's always a lovely camaraderie. Um, there's actually a, there's a local Irish bar by us um, that's uh, owned by the family of one of the one of the dance schools, and I was, you know, uh, it's just kind of a, a hangout spot, um, nice place. And I, I was <laughs> one day, and I was looking over the photos on the wall. And I'm like, is that Peter? <laughs> <laughs> it's Peter from like 1964 oh. St. Patrick's Day Parade. Wow. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, the, the school for me and dancing for me became, um, an opportunity to see a lot of different places. Uh, I was fortunate enough to qualify for the world championship 10 or 11 times, I wow. think. Uh, and so I was able to, able to go to Scotland, uh, with my dad, um, and able to, uh, you know, go to nationals and things and have my parents there and, and my sisters there. Both of my sisters are champion dancers. Um, so, you know, we would all go and, and have, have that. Uh, I'm still very close with, uh, with, with Jimmy and with Amy and Terry. Uh, they both all came to see the show. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I still show up at class sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Pop in. Huh? <laughs> Just walk in the door like, yeah, I gotta gotta do a couple of rounds. I'm going back on tour. I need to be in shape for this. Get tuned up. Yeah, that was always nice when you have that that rapport with with your your school. Yeah. yeah. So what led yeah. you into show dancing? Was it you know, and, and le I guess leaving competition and going into show dancing? Well, it was a really hard. It was a really hard adjustment because at the end of my competitive career. Um, you know, I was in class four or five nights a week and um, my dad was an actor and a theater person and I'm an actor and a theater person. I kind of knew that this was where it was going to go. But, you know, you really don't think when you've been doing something as a, as a pattern for so long, you don't really think about what it's going to be like to be in a different, be in a different mode. Like, you know, Tuesday night for the bulk of my life was spent in a studio with Jimmy and Friday night was in a studio with Amy. And like, 
you know, when you're, I was never the, the, you know, top of the top of the top, uh, in terms of competition. Um, but I, you know, like, I, I believe that the highest that I came in was, uh, would be just outside the top 10 at the worlds. So like okay. 11th, 11th or 14th, like, I can't remember off the top of my head, but like, you know, to be competing at that level, you're, you're in class all the time and you're doing, and then all of a sudden, you know, you competition ends and now you start to move into a, move into a, you know, a mode where you have to have a professional life as well. Right. Um, so I was, and, and um, you know, it happened by accident that my, my, my cousin booked a uh, tour with a show called Rhythm in the Night. And I was 21 at the time, I think. And said, well, they're going out again. You want to send your stuff in? And it was just kind of like, I'm looking for a gig anyway. Anyway, this is a gig. I can take this gig. And uh, I did. <laughs> and I did two tours with them. And um, from from that, um, the show dancing community, and at least as far as I have experienced it, is, mm-hmm. it's not small, but a lot of people get work by, you know, you get that text message, hey, there's a show that's looking for such and such. Can you send your stuff in? Um so once I had met a couple of those people, uh, I got introduced to the company that produces Celtic Angels, and they had some other Irish acts that I was able to get signed on as a dancer for, um, you know, and it just it just worked out that way. That for the last couple of years, um, the uh, the Christmas and St. Patrick's Day tours with the show have been you know good offers. They're they're good shows to work on as a performer um you know they they pay pretty fairly so right so that's been uh yeah that's that's sort of how i got into that okay um, and yeah and the, uh yeah i was gonna ask you uh talk for those people who have never been in shows any kind of show whether it's a show like uh like what you're talking about or if it's river dance or lord of the dance and stuff like that what's the audition process? Let's say you don't know anybody, you know, you don't have that connection where if someone can vouch for you and you just Uh see something on Facebook says, Hey, you know, this show is touring, send your audition in or email the audition. What's the audition process like for most people? So Riverdance and Lord of the Dance are kind of in their own category. Riverdance does the summer school thing and they have that process and, you know, Lord of the Dance has their own thing but for stuff like this it's a lot of video submissions okay um actually if you have any any listeners that are uh that are on now uh i can send you the the email link after the post if you want but we're sure. accepting auditions for male dancers and female singers for our upcoming tour and you know to be on the roster for that um <clears throat> it's you know uh i would recommend if you've got some good treble reel or quote unquote showy material, um, yeah, you want to send, you know, 32 bars that show that you can dance. Um, a lot of people I think get in their heads about it. Like, and I have this problem as, as an actor because in the post COVID era, self taping is still, you know, yeah, I used to go stand online in uh, on Eighth Avenue at six thirty in the morning to get into a building, and now I do eighty takes of sixteen bars so that I can submit it to someone. <laughs> um, it can that process can be a little daunting because any any dancer that I know will watch a video of themselves dancing and they'll go, "Got to do that again." That right. beat wasn't you know it wasn't quite perfect. Um, and I think that one of the big things that you got to do is get out of your own way, like set a limit. I'm going to do this three times and then pick the best out of three because the people that are watching these audition videos are also human beings and they're, they're not, you know, I don't think that most of them are looking for um, you to be like, 
no one is expecting to see David Geeney's feet when <laughs> they open up your audition video. Uh, what they want to know is that, you know, you can dance, that you can project some kind of presence. Don't be looking down at your feet, you know, big, big open, right. you know, like, like you're on stage, you know, mm. um, and they're looking for whether or not you can dance in time with the music. And a bonus on that is, do you have a couple neat tricks that, that are, you know, appropriately placed? Can you dance well? Because a lot of these, you know, a lot of the time you're going to be doing, you're not always going to be doing nth level, you know, choreography. A lot of the time is, okay, we're going to do a couple of formations now that are going to involve us doing, um, trying to think of the non-crass way, to, the easy step. Mm-hmm. Treble on a 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 toe treble on a treble on like that or a bang treble on a treble on a treble on a back bang treble on a treble on a treble on like that shows up in most shows you know that chorus line dancing yeah yeah and for show dancing one of the big things to to get um to get into your into your head about it is that like as competitive dancers, we are trained to dance for three or five or seven judges that are sitting at the front of the table and glancing down at their, you know, like you're in people who are experts in how to judge what you're doing. And never once have I ever been in in a in a show with a with a room full of you know we perform for two and three thousand people and the number of people that have any idea what irish dancing is from a technical perspective is negligible it does not exist right so you got to get your head in that space of what audience am i performing for now mm-hmm. you know um i do this bit in my solo that makes me uh a little bit crazy every night <laughs> Because I do a couple of, I would say, reasonably tricky rhythm patterns. I, I think I do like like five or six triple clicks in a row, mm-hmm. and the crowd is just like, "What's that?" And then I do, um, I do typically five like front clicks up to mm-hmm. my face, which is the only difficulty in that skill set is staying flexible and just you know going through basic stretching it's not something that a dancer looks at and goes like wow that's really impressive right. and the audience every night is just like oh my god that's the most amazing thing oh yeah you know yeah so i think that's a big thing in in dancing and in shows is getting used to um being attentive to what the audience actually wants to see what are the, the choreographers and I guess show directors generally looking for. And I asked this, people watch my podcast. I have a lot of show dancers on and I always ask them this question because it's interesting to me while, while everyone has some basic things, they'll say, well, this, we're always looking for X. Every so often I get someone says, well, actually they're looking for Y and Z and they may have a little bit different take on it. What do you think makes a good performer, especially a performer who may be new to the game of performing, not a seasoned pro? One of the things about being in a show, in any kind of show, um, especially when you're on tour, um, because we do, we, we were on the road from rehearsal started November 21st, and I flew home December 24th at around noon. Mm-hmm. So from the 21st of November until Christmas Eve, I did everything with these 15 people. We were, you know, traveling together in the bus. We would get to the hotel. We would be together at the hotel. Then we'd go to the venue. We'd be together. So, excuse me. I think the the element of how well you can play nicely with others doesn't get talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, because here's... If you want to have, I, I would say, if you want to have a a career working and performing, 
one of the most important things that you can do is be pleasant to work with. And being pleasant to work with means that you're, you're going to show up, you know, positive. And I'm not, I'm not talking about like the, there's genuine reasons to get vexed or, you know, on the road, right. it can be tough, but generally speaking, you, you want to show up, you know, positive, excited to perform, um, to engage in the process of, if it's a show like Celtic Angels, where we change numbers every year, um, one of the things that is really critical there is that all of the guys are prepared to bring something to the table. Because at least for my for my process, just to tangent a little bit, I I don't know how other folk work, but I get sample recordings of what the new tracks are going to be from the music director that are done like a MIDI file. So I, you know, listen to those and then I talk to the director and I get a, a full book of like dancers come out and do stuff here. This happens here. Like, um, and then I'll try to make up a couple of rhythms that go to that and I'll send them out to the guys so that we all have the same sort of rhythms. But when we get together in the space, we have a couple of days to be like, okay, what works on this group of five people? What looks really, what, what makes all of us look really good? Because when you're choreographing by yourself and you're just coming up with rhythms, you're doing, and I'm super guilty of this, you're doing the rhythms that you're comfortable with. I am very, very comfortable throwing like quick triple flex into things. And yeah. that is just not some people's bag. Mm -hmm. So then there are other things that, you know, I, there are other things that, that wouldn't occur to me that are much, that, that actually wind up fitting the music much better. So when we have that situation where I'm, where, you know, I've created some steps, we're now putting bodies into them. When you, when you're in a process like that, that's going to have that little workshop period at the beginning, you want to make sure that you're being a positive contribution to that, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. And you'll run into things that you don't, um, you will run into things that you cannot do immediately that are just, you know, some people do travel, hop and toe heel. Some people do travel, hop and heel toe right mm -hmm. and i do toe heel we had one dancer here that on um, the last show that did heel toe and he was beating himself up over and i was like yeah you know it's wrong we gotta fix it but like i can see you here constantly working on this mm -hmm. it's gonna be okay mm -hmm. it's gonna get right you know that's the kind of the kind of attitude and the kind of energy that you want to bring into it okay so that that willingness to be cooperative with the process you know, even if the process frustrates the crap out of you sometimes. <laughs> well, and reading the room is super important because, you know, if you get into a show like you get into a show like ours where there is that expressed desire for, you know, what are the, like the creativity of finding out what these five guys look like dancing together. Um, then you, you know, you can really, find your place and where you contribute to that um the choreography for river dance is not changing it right. does not require your input it does not require your help yeah. you know like yeah you know learning learning to read that room and and knowing when to speak and when to address something after rehearsal right you know and which comes with experience but sure so the last couple of questions I've got for you, Dan, is one, speaking of, of touring and performing as, as an adult who's done with competition, has it come back the way it used, maybe it used to have been prior to COVID? Can, can one make a, a living out of doing this or is this purely going to be a passion thing and maybe you make a little money on the side a couple of times a year? What's the outlook economically for this very, very career path? Um, well, everything depends upon your definition of success. 
are there enough to strictly be? No, no, there are not. I mean, if there are, I don't know about it. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities for performers to integrate this into part of their part of their performing. I mean, unfortunately, there just are not going to be as many gigs in July as there are in March. Right. Um, you know, but if you are looking at it from the perspective of, you know, I'm going to do performing and I'm going to teach and I'm going to do workshop lessons and I'm going to do, then yeah, yeah, that's something you can do. That's something a lot of people do. I mean, um, you know, like Tyler Schwartz is off giving, giving workshops and, you know, figuring out how to, how to, how to do that. But it's, you know, it is, it is going to involve a little bit of a hustle. Um, and if you're someone like, like me who, you know, makes the bulk of my work throughout the years, like musical theater stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I certainly view it as, as success that two of the gigs that I have, two of the, the, the contracts that I have this year are Irish dancing. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And you never know when it's, it's always been a really interesting uh, conversation starter. Cause it's on my, on my resume when I hand in my headshot. <laughs> Like, what does that mean? You know, champion level Irish dancers. Well, I, yeah. you know, traveled around and competed in these competitions and I did this stuff, you know? Right. Right. And so uh, lastly, yeah. you mentioned uh, earlier in the interview, you have sisters that, that were high level dancers. You have an extended family that are accomplished sure. dancers. So that begs the question, what are you and they going to do with your Irish dance in the future? Is there, is there a school in the works somewhere in there or is there, is it, <laughs> you just enjoying how you, what you're doing now with it? I have to take one more section for my TCRG exam. Kaylee teaching. Am I right? It's oh, just, yes. Uh, I guess you. It's a monster. At least, at least I passed the solo teaching portion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did too. I failed the Kaylee years ago as well. I'm with you there. <laughs> they say that's um, what most people fail so yeah well it's it's so it's so funny because i actually i have the book is just at a screenshot um 30 popular kaylee dances is definitely one way to interpret 10 dances that you are going to see and are allowed to be done in competition and 20 that you will never hear of ever no I just, i'm just i'm just joking um, you like to teaching I would really be very happy if I got my TCRG in the next couple of years and I was able to uh, teach with the school that I, you know, grew up dancing with. Um, that would, that would really be cool. I do go help out of class very occasionally, um, but I'd like to do that. And then, I mean, down the line, yeah, that would be really, really cool. At the moment, it's very hard because our regional championship is Thanksgiving weekend. And Thanksgiving weekend, I'm typically in Florida prepping a show to go out. So um, that that gets a little difficult. Well, my sisters take their tests, and they definitely will. And they will probably pass on the first time, unlike me. <laughs> um, they are much harder than them. You know, that would uh, that'd be, that'd be fun. Uh, but to, to tag on your thought about um, the economics of dancing, mm -hmm. my middle sister, Teresa... Um, actually you can, you know, find her on Instagram. She's the dancing doc, like a bunch of people. My, there are a bunch of Irish dancers, my age that went into physical therapy. Oh, um, okay. my, my sister is one of them because she watched us for years dancing on tile on top of concrete and having, you know, arthritis in our late teens. And, you know, she got really passionate about figuring out how to prevent that from happening. So that's good. She has a physical therapy business that's now focused pretty heavily on Irish dancing. She'll do warm ups and workouts with people. Uh, she had a table up at the Oroctus where she was helping warm people up. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's like her career. Now her job is a small business that she runs that is not exclusively Irish dancing, but Right. It's geared toward Irish dancers. Yeah. And that's, it's yeah. a testament to 
the business of Irish dancing, which has developed over the years. It did a lot of these, these businesses and side businesses didn't exist in the past, but now, you know, as needs have arise, people are always going to address the needs that come mm -hmm. up and there's opportunities there. Yeah. I was commenting on a post I'd made about uh, some stories I was writing on NASA and I was out with one of the, uh, the P they call them PAOs out there, not a PRO, but mm -hmm. I had to pop the trunk to get the camera out to take a picture of this, uh, moon rover uh, experimental vehicle that they use to test for future technology and and I was like oh never mind the two rolls of Mo uh, two rolls of Marley that's rolled up in the back of my little SUV and she's like what's that for and I said well that's a uh, you know we do a lot of performing and you, you got to throw it on the floor so that you have a safe place mm -hmm. for dancers to dance yeah. And, uh, so yeah you're right about that I think that um, Instagram and a lot of the newer I guess Instagram isn't newer. Um, the stuff wasn't around when I was a kid. Like you couldn't, you couldn't watch Tyler do ten clicks in a row. Yeah, no. Like there wasn't that. You just, you know, and I was fortunate enough to be in a competition that had a lot of very strong male dancers who would, you know, just handily beat me weekend after weekend. Um, and it was cool because like you one you'd practice harder so that you would you know win but you know we had guys like I, I don't know if anyone would know any of these people but like I was at a fesh one day in Pennsylvania and uh you know Nick Paulson comes across the stage and he does a triple front click mm -hmm. as I'm about to get up and do my reel and I went oh and I don't mean like, I don't mean like it was waste time, I mean like up to his face, one, two, three. Yeah. And I went, oh, awesome. Great. I know what I'm now spending the yeah. next month trying to learn how to do. Yeah. Um, but that's now available in, on your phone 24-7 yep. because you've got, you know, David Gini breaking people's minds with the way that his ankles twist. And, you know, you have all of these other dancers. There's um, a really cool company in Mexico called Nevin. Uh, mm -hmm. N-E-M-H-A-I-N, -E something like that. Um, but the guys that run that are, you know, tap dancers and Irish dancers. Mm -hmm. um, Sergio and Fran are both, yep. you know, high placing dancers oh, yeah. and they're doing really cool stuff. And yep. so, you know, you, you, you have the opportunity to be exposed to so much neat choreography that's, oh, yeah. you know, it's effectively just people being like, hey, look what I can do. Yeah, um, well, Tyler breaks, breaks really... down. Yeah, Tyler, I was going to say Tyler breaks down so many of those those trick moves. There's been so many things I've gone and looked at. And it's like, I always wondered how did they, how people were doing that. I pick yeah. up stuff like that on that all the time. You know, it's good. Yeah. Well, it's actually, it's actually kind of funny. It's actually kind of funny thing as I think about Celtic Angels and choreographing that show um, and like how I grew up with, you know, the teacher would demonstrate at the front of the class and then everyone would try to get it. And there wasn't a video to go back to. There wasn't, I couldn't slow down and zoom in on the feet and go, oh, that's what that is. Right. So um, one of the things that I've found is that like, you know, every dancer has their own kind of idiosyncrasies and there's, you know, common rhythms and things <laughs> that some of us just do a little differently. Right, right. You know, it makes the same, it makes the same beat, but at the time, at the time, uh, they demonstrated it three times in front of the class and I got something that sounded right and I'm, you know, nearly six feet tall, so I was in the back of the room anyway yeah. and, uh, it never got corrected, so that's just sort of how I spell that particular beat. Yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, we video our classes a lot, and a lot yeah. of people do now, and you can go on and you can pick up all kinds of stuff, but uh, that's good. Well, well, Dan, in the couple of minutes that we have left, uh, if you can, point us or point anyone to any kind of website or social media where people can find out about the shows you're involved in, whether they want to submit oh. resumes or just check them out for themselves. Yes. So um, the Instagram for our show is Celtic Angels Show. 
Uh, you can follow that and all of the tour updates will be posted um, as well as, you know, videos and things from tour. I post a lot when we're on the road, behind the scenes videos and stuff like that. I guess somebody would be interested in that. <laughs> um, uh, if you're interested in following me personally, that would be Dan underscore Drew three. Um, you know, uh, there's dancing and singing up on there. Um, anyone interested in looking at um, some of the other stuff that this company has going on, that would be CMI Entertainment. Um, we're also available at CelticAngels.com. Awesome. Very yeah. good. So, well, hope very to see good. a couple folks out there. Yeah, that would be great. Well, Dan, look, I wish you all the best with your teaching endeavors and your show endeavors, and thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was really great talking.